Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're going to do a video uh, about Amelia Earhart, not really in our uh, subject area. However, the Battleship Colorado led the search effort for her, and uh, because of my previous job, I actually have a lot of thoughts about this. She has popped up in the news again because of the sonar image that may be her aircraft. Um, too soon to tell on that, really interesting. Amelia Earhart's loss was caused by a failure to establish communications. With equipment like this 1940s era radio equipment we have here on Battleship New Jersey. The radio room on the Coast Guard cutter Itasca would have been very similar to this. She was flying from Ley, an airfield on New Guinea, which would gain some fame during uh, World War II when the Japanese were flying aircraft out of it over the uh, Owen Stanley mountain range, and uh, was trying to find the U.S. possession of Howland Island. Howland Island was one of the equatorial islands that was uh, colonized by the United States during the interwar period. It is a real tiny atoll, and there were precious little in the way of facilities there. But, being a flat coral reef, it was able to have a, uh, a runway on it. We have a very cool upcoming event here at Battleship New Jersey. On Saturday, February 24th, 2024, Drakinafel is going to be on board at 1.30 p.m. to give a presentation. He's doing a presentation on the Iowa class versus the Yamato class, and I'm going to give a short presentation on our plans for our upcoming dry dock. All proceeds from this event are going to benefit the battleship's upcoming dry docking, and it'll be one of the last days you can visit the ship before we leave for dry dock. So, be sure to click the link in the description below to get your tickets to come and meet Trakinafel on board the Battleship New Jersey. 1.30, February 24th, 2024. See you there. This part of the ocean has a tremendous number of islands, and the colonial powers had uh, really gobbled them up. To the north and west, Japan had taken over the former German colonies after World War I as part of the uh, peace settlement, and uh, those were all part of the Japanese mandate. These were many of the islands like the Marshalls and the Gilberts that the United States ends up invading a couple years later in World War II. Along the equator, you had a number of islands that were split up uh, between Great Britain and the United States. The only resource these islands had was guano from all of the seabirds that would roost there as they were flying across the Pacific. But this guano could be mined, and uh, so the folks who did that clamored for their various countries to claim those possessions. Nowadays, they're wildlife protectorates because of those same seabirds. Uh, the French also had a number of colonial possessions more to the south of there. What did colonization of these islands look like? Uh, in some instances, they're completely empty and just said that these are owned by so-and-so or, or by such-and-such. Such. Um, but since, uh, particularly with some of these line islands, the United States and Great Britain were butting heads over who owned them and who had the rights to mine guano on them, the uh, U.S. actually decided to put colonists on these islands. Initially, they had uh, some military people, uh, army veterans, retire and then uh, take them out to the islands. And these guys went insane. They're, they're on islands in the middle of the ocean. There was nothing to do. Uh, they, they lost their minds and, and they couldn't keep people on these islands. So they decided to take Hawaiian native high school students and uh, drop them on these islands because these kids, it's what they did in their free time. They, they go to the beach and they surf and they fish and they have a wild time. And uh, I've, I've read lots of accounts from these guys that um, they had a, had a great time there and, and had a lot of fun. It's just a couple of 16-year-old boys on a deserted island. They did not go Lord of the Flies. These islands had no resources, so everything had to be brought in. And to do this, the United States Coast Guard is looking to reposition itself after uh, Prohibition ended. How's the Coast Guard going to keep getting funding now that the thing that they were doing uh, is no longer a thing? Fortunately, right after Prohibition, flying boats like the Pan Am Clippers started to become prevalent. So, 
Uh, the Coast Guard sold the Congress that they were going to build new cutters, long-range cutters, and send them out on these trans-oceanic, uh, commonly used flight paths so that if any of these aircraft had issues, there would be a cutter nearby to rescue the planes and the passengers. So, uh, for most of the late 30s, up until the beginning of World War II, the United States sent two Coast Guard cutters, and these cutters would alternate, uh, essentially going to and from the station, and uh, they would just sail from Honolulu, they were part of Naval District 14, down to these uh, Lion Islands, and they'd go from island to island to island, dropping off supplies, and then they'd turn around and go back, and the next one would leave and do the same thing over and over again. These two cutters were the brand new Coast Guard cutter Taney, which I worked on in Baltimore for a number of years, which is why I have thoughts on this, uh, and the uh, slightly older Coast Guard cutter Itasca. Itasca ends up getting sold to Great Britain as part of Lend-Lease uh, to be used as an anti-submarine sloop during World War II. Taney is retained by the United States uh, and actually is the cutter that evacuates all the colonists at the outbreak of war, shells any facilities that are there, and then leads the effort to retake those islands later on in the war. It turns out they hadn't been occupied, uh, but that didn't stop them from hitting the beaches anyway. At the time of the Earhart flight, Itasca was the cutter supposed to be on station, even though Taney was newer and uh, had some better equipment. So some of that equipment and a radio operator from Taney were transferred to Itasca for this cruise. Itasca takes up a station near Howland Atoll and uh, is transmitting radio signals and uh, is prepared to light off the boilers in such a way they would make black smoke that, that's easy to spot for the aircraft as it's homing in on the island. The problem is there are hundreds of little islands out there in the ocean, uh, so many that the, the shade created by all the cloud cover could have confused you to what's an island and what isn't. So it was vitally important that Earhart be able to hone in on the island that actually had an airfield on it, Howland Island. The method she was supposed to be using is radio direction finding. If you send out a constant radio signal, you can use an antenna to hone in on where that signal is loudest. And that will give you a line of bearing to that transmitting station. In this case, the transmitting station is an antenna on the Coast Guard Cutter Atasca, which is anchored right off of, I don't know if she was anchored, she might have been running a racetrack, right off Howland Island. Uh, for a variety of reasons that have been much written about in books and other places, uh, she and her navigator, Fred Noonan, were unable to establish contact with Itasca, and they were never able to find their position. Uh, Itasca could hear them transmitting just fine for large parts of the flight and thought that they were relatively close by. The issue is, this is really the very beginning of transoceanic flights, and the navigation methods, and more importantly for Earhart, the search methods are brand new, and they didn't have the kind of experience and the doctrine developed to be able to effectively search. The search efforts last a little over two weeks, about 17 days. Or I should say the initial search efforts, because there have been an unending stream of searches ever since then, from her husband sending out privately funded searches within months of the end of the uh, official search, to searches like today, where they found this intriguing sonar contact. The initial search cost four million dollars, the most expensive one up till that point, four million dollars in 1937 dollars, uh, and covered 150,000 square miles of ocean, mostly to the north and west of Howland, where it seemed like her radio signals were coming from. Uh, Itasca was having issues radio position finding her, just like she was having issues uh, with Itasca, which shows the, the differences in radio equipment that, that the ship and the aircraft were having that, that caused issues. If you're operating at different frequencies or you can't receive voice transmissions and whatnot, uh, causes all sorts of issues, as they found out. 
Of course, by the time you send more capable vessels uh, with larger radio rooms, like a battleship, uh, it, it's too late. The aircraft has to have power to be able to transmit. And if she's run out of fuel, obviously she doesn't have power. If she's crashed into the ocean, obviously her electronics aren't working. Fortunately, the battleship Colorado was doing an ROTC cruise and happened to be in port in Honolulu at roughly the time that uh, Amelia Earhart goes missing. So when the search happens, the commander of Naval District 14 tells the captain of Colorado to take over the search efforts and dispatches him to Howland Island. Howland is about halfway uh, directly between Hawaii and Guadalcanal to give you an idea of distance. A battleship like Colorado uh, was an effective unit to choose because the commanding officer has a lot of experience. He can coordinate the search efforts with other vessels. Because uh, during that time period she would have been carrying about three aircraft designed for gunnery spotting but could be used for search and rescue and, and those sorts of things. And they did use the aircraft uh, to run search patterns. And, uh, like I talked about before, because her radio equipment would have been more effective than what was on Itasca both higher power, longer range stuff, and a, a wider variety of equipment, which would have allowed for a wider variety of frequencies and um, other stuff like that. There was more likelihood of being able to make a connection. Interestingly, we still debate what kind of radio equipment was installed on the aircraft during that particular leg of the flight. Uh, so we don't know it today. They didn't know at that time what the best frequency was or the best equipment to reach out to her on was. In addition to Colorado, the aircraft carrier Lexington was dispatched. Lexington would have carried about 90 aircraft during this time period and would have been really great at running uh, search patterns. Uh, the Coast Guard cutter Itasca was, of course, there. And then when she trades off with Taney at the end of her roughly month-long cruise of the Line Islands, uh, Taney takes over search efforts in the area. And really, at this point, the Coast Guard just says, hey, keep an eye out for anything related to them as you're cruising the Line Islands. Nobody else is in those waters. Um, of course, nothing is found. Because the American ships weren't going to violate uh, Japanese sovereignty and sail into the Japanese mandate, the Japanese voluntarily participated in this international search and rescue effort and sent two ships of their own, a survey vessel named Koshu and the seaplane tender Kamoi. So again, you're seeing a lot of ships being dispatched that have indigenous aircraft capabilities. Uh, and, and so they're, they're searching huge areas here. The fact that they don't find her in the north and west uh, tells me that she wasn't in that area. The current uh, sonar ping uh, seems to show her about 100 miles due west of Howland. And I'm not entirely convinced that that is her aircraft. Again, it seems to be the area that has been searched during the initial search, and it seems to be open ocean. Um, my thought is, given the, the line of bearing they would have been able to take, even without radio direction finding, they should have gotten close to Howland, and they probably ended up south of the island uh, if the search to the north didn't find them. What's more, I have a suspicion, there, there are so many islands in that part of the world, there's no reason she should have been lost at sea or that her aircraft should be in three miles of water. Uh, she would have been able to land in the water near an island or potentially even crash landed on an island. She had crashed before. She was a really experienced aviator. Uh, I have no doubts that she was able to navigate close to Howland and that uh, she would have been able to safely land the aircraft as she was running out of fuel. Like she knew for a couple of hours that she wasn't getting this, this radio contact and that she was low on fuel. Like she, she made a plan to ditch the aircraft, and I have no doubts that she would have found an island. Unfortunately, that island uh, would have likely been uninhabited, relatively small, and, and those waters, again, they're not very visited by ships or aircraft. Uh, so, so that's my suspicion. There has been uh, some pretty active searches uh, a little bit further to the south of an island uh, alternately referred to as Gardner or Nikamaruru. And um, those have not turned up anything conclusive yet, but I tend to think that something in that area is more likely to be the case uh, than something to the west or, or the north. Um, but as better 
deep sea equipment is found. And as the search continues, I am sure we will get more information and we'll be able to see how accurate my assumptions are. What's your theory on Amelia Earhart's disappearance? Let us know in the comments section down below. Also, make sure you go and visit the Coast Guard Cutter Taney, a historic ship that actually participated in the original search for Amelia Earhart. And as far as I know, the only one that's been preserved. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. Really appreciate your support and your ideas for future videos.